<laughs> <laughs> Welcome. This is the Genesee County Compassion Club show. We're coming back to you again today. Take four. <laughs> yeah. We've had a few technical difficulties. If you didn't catch the uh, first part of the show, John will post those for you. You guys can look them up, see what we're talking about in detail. I'm going to give you a quick recap of what we've been talking about today. And, uh, again, apologize for the technical difficulties we're having. Hopefully we can capture this all in one segment and uh, make sense out of it when we're done. But uh, at any rate, thanks for joining us. This is the Genesee County Compassion Club show. We've got some stuff we want to cover from the uh, the Compassion Club events going on, and then we got the local and national news on medical marijuana. Uh, quick recap, like I said, we'll start out with our events. We have the Adopt a Highway coming up here. It's on uh, May 12th. It's a Saturday. Join us down at the club, 10 a.m., and we're going to head out and clean up our two different sections, one on M13 and one on Dort Highway. It's the first one of this year, 2014, you know, and after the snow, we definitely need your help. So come on out if you can spare the time. We definitely appreciate it. We'll provide gloves and vest and safety training video. And then on top of that, we'll provide food and refreshment afterwards back at the club when we're done for those of you who participate. And it uh, should be a lot of fun. It's Saturday the 12th. Please join us. Hopefully we'll have nice weather and, and we can get these areas of Genesee County cleaned up. Uh, next thing is the 420 party. This is happening on April 19th, 419. Mark your calendars. It's a Saturday. It's going to be a fun event out at the club. We've got a lot of important, uh, important, a lot of fun events, uh, coming to you, for you. We're going to have, uh, an Easter egg celebration. This is going to kind of be like our cash cube thing. We're just keeping in the spirit of Easter. We're going to have John Sinclair out there. Uh, man, we talked about John Sinclair in our previous segment, segment. If you want to catch that, go back and look that up. But uh, this guy is an influential figure in social change and also in medical marijuana and, and in people's rights. Uh, John Sinclair has been a figure in this industry for you know almost 40 years, and we're glad to have him. He's going to be coming up to the Genesee County Compassion Club as a part of our celebration, doing some speaking and some visiting. So you guys can sit and chill, get a chance to meet the man. And uh, he's a really down-to-earth fella, so don't be intimidated. He's a lot of fun, and uh, you might even learn something. You know, he's quite an in intellectual individual, and he knows everybody who's anybody. Yeah, I sure mean, does. I mean, I, I think his like his his Rolodex is probably as, as impressive as the president. <laughs> yeah, you know, I'm serious. Probably more so, but probably more so. Yeah, he's you know, been more active in it for a lot longer. Have a lot more people you'd actually want to meet. Yeah, because I don't, I wouldn't want to meet these other world leaders. They're a bunch of people that look in a bad and ill-fitting suits and and they're tyrants. So I mean, unless you're looking for donations. I don't, yeah, that might be a good idea. Maybe, should, maybe I should start sucking it up being nice to people. Maybe, maybe. Yeah. All right, we're also going to have a local leader and a man of the movement, Adam Brook. Adam Brook's been a forefront leader in the Hash Bash down there in Ann Arbor, which is coming up this Saturday. Don't forget about that. Um, but Adam Brook will be at the club on our 419, 420 party, and he'll be speaking and sharing with us. He spent some time in federal penitentiary uh, for being, uh, you know, part of the drug movement, and uh, so we'll get a chance to hear his story, get his testimony, and uh, also fun stuff. We've got some food coming from Backyard Barbecue. Everybody loves that place. It's simply amazing food. And we're also going to have the Hot Dog Man, Hot Dog Cart Man from Davison. He'll be coming up customizing your dog. Uh, he's going to be there. Party starts at 11 o'clock, so come on down. You can get your tickets to the club right now. That includes your food and fun, and uh, we'll, we'll be glad to have you. We're going to have our twist off, our, uh, most, our most bestest ever jointest. Uh, contest rolling contest going on. We'll have the most creative and uh, a lot of other fun events. So join us down there April 19th, 11 a.m. Looking forward to having it. Uh, next event coming up, Soup Kitchen. It comes up this Friday. Join us at the club 2 p.m. We'll carpool on over to the North End Soup Kitchen and be making and serving food down there. And again, that's the North End Soup Kitchen. I'm always glad to be a part of that and we could use your help. Um, all right, I got some news items I'm going to share with you. Run through the first couple quickly here. Kind of previously covered these on our segments. They got kicked off, uh, but like I said, you can go back and check those out for yourself. Talked a little bit about the Colorado crackdown on medical marijuana users. Right now, if you're a patient or caregiver out there in Colorado, this is for medicinal purposes, not recreational. Uh, you've been able to grow up to six plants. That's the limit. Now, if your patient needed more, then you would get a recommenda recommendation from his or her physician and they would say whether or not that patient actually needed you or needed that patient themselves to grow more than six plants. Uh, currently, this has been the standing rule, and it's been utilized, and now the Health Department of Colorado is kicking back on those doctors saying, hey, wait a minute, we're not really sure if what you're recommending is actually what the patient needs, and we want to have more information 
from you regarding why do they actually need more than six plants to be grown for them. So uh, Colorado, not too happy with the changes here that they're trying to implement. There's been legislation introduced to the same tune, which is basically saying, look, we don't want these recommending uh, for more than six plants. We don't want that to happen anymore. So we're looking to make it just a limit of six plants. Cannot have more than six in any case. And, uh, you know, there's people out there in Colorado that are medicinally using this, have been doing so for quite some time, and uh, they're not happy about this. You know, this has taken away their ability to have the amount of uh, medicine that they need, and it's pushing them into the recreational market. And we talked about this. I mean, the recreational market, the medicine out there, which it's medicine to them, even though it's being sold recreationally, it comes at a premium. And on top of that, there's an additional tax that's associated with it that's, you know, it's increasing the cost of the medicine to these patients. So you can understand why they don't like this change or they don't like the pushback that's being given out there in Colorado, and you can't blame the people for it. Um, you know, these folks have been using this as medication, like I said, for quite some time. The Colorado program, I think, has been enacted since, uh, I want to say 2004. Um, so it's nothing new out there, and you know, as uh, patients should be able to, they should be able to get the medicine they need to the quantity that they need and, and not have to worry about, you know, switching up their sources and being haggled through the state's legal system. But it is what it is. So um, that, that's what's going out there in Colorado. I guess maybe recreational marijuana isn't all it's cracked up to be, especially for those folks that are using it for medicinal purposes. Um, and you know, you're seeing the same kind of blowback in Washington. So be wary what you wish for. Uh, next news info item I have is uh, there's a report that came out. This is from UT of Dallas. Um, basically, they put out a survey a report, not a survey, excuse me, did a little research and they checked out the 20 states that have medical marijuana uh, and found out that the crime rates in those states have not gone up as what the opposition might suggest. They've actually reduced. Um, you know, in addition to that, I was talking to Brian at the club and he was mentioning to me there's a report out there that seconds that information basically showing that DUIs here in Michigan have gone down since 2009. Uh, I don't know if that's in relation to medical marijuana itself. It certainly could be. Um, but you, at any rate, have no right to say that because medical marijuana has been made available to patients, that crime has gone up. Now, there's a parallel between that and the concealed carry. I mean, the concealed carry, they were predicting you know, murder in the streets, and if more guns out there, more people are going to whack each other over stupid stuff. That never was realized. It's, it's basically the, the, the leadership wants to fuel that kind of fantasy. Yeah, I mean, it's no... no no different. I mean, the fear propaganda wheel never stops spinning, and it's certainly always put out there. Uh, and, uh, you know, like a lot of times, it just comes up blatantly false. I mean, these are just things that people put out in the media, try to perpetuate their own views, their own personal beliefs, uh, their own priorities, whatever it is they're trying to push, and basically spit out lies that, uh, you know, thankfully, according to places like this and, uh, you know, other institutions out there that do real research, you know, they get blown up in their face. They got egg on their face. And uh, I like seeing that happen. I like seeing the truth be exposed. Political leaders like to use uh, fear. And once that's gone, and it, they're furious, they're grasped at straws. Yeah. Well, and, and this is uh, one of a few reports I've seen in the last couple of years. I mean, Rand McNally put out a study uh, a couple of years ago about the same kind of information related to uh, crime, you know, actually going down in neighborhoods where marijuana was made available for medicinal purposes. Um, and th that report was actually squashed. They said, well, we don't want you to put that out there. If you do, we're not going to sponsor you anymore, blah, 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 the powers that be. And uh, so Rand kind of put that survey in their back room and then locked it up. But, you know, it doesn't stop other organizations out there from going out and collecting the same data. Uh, there's a journal published March 26. The team looked at FBI crime data for all 50 states between 1990 and 2006 and analyzed the effect of medical marijuana laws on seven types of violent crime. It says, over the years studied, medical marijuana laws were passed in 11 states. Uh, none of the seven crime types, including burglary, larceny, or car theft, seemed to rise after the medical marijuana laws were passed. So, uh, you know, like, this is echoing, you know, not that marijuana makes things better when it comes to due to crime, but you can't argue that medical marijuana, you know, being made available legally is uh, an induction 
for the increase in crime. It just does not correlate. Well, that's what it's the, not there. The biggest portion of that crime was the fact that people were using marijuana, which was still illegal at that time. When you cut that off and they'll make it a little longer illegal. Well, I mean, yeah, but we're, they, they, I see what you're yeah. saying, John, and I'm not disagreeing, but, but these, these crime types here have nothing to do with that. We're talking about burglary. I, it's, larceny, but know, see, the thing is, theft. But then, well, the point I was going to make with this is that uh, they want that kind of stuff because it's all about money. Either, you know, that's right, you get a medical marijuana offense person, you're going to be able to tag, get as much money out of them as possible for legal fees. Okay, it's not a real crime, but they still can sap you for the money. Yeah. That's all they're concerned about. Money and power, these big politicians are about. Huh. Well, in addition to these here, they also have another study that showed, uh, and this kind of echoed what Brian was saying, there's a decrease in traffic fatalities following the passage of statewide medical marijuana measures. So, um, you know, you take it for what it's worth. I, I think, you know, to come out and say, well, you know, yeah, because there's medical marijuana, there's, there's less homicide in the city now. I don't know if that's necessarily true. But what you can say on the, on the flip side of the coin is there's no evidence to point that medical marijuana increased crime because it didn't. Crime went down in the time that medical marijuana was made legal. So, uh, you know, correlations, whatever, ratios, I mean, I, you leave it to the economist and all the other people to figure out what they want to argue over. But what you can't argue, what's not disputable, is that crime does not go up when medical marijuana, or when marijuana, for that matter, is made legal. That's a good thing, obviously. I mean, uh, it shows that the sky is not going to fall if you make things legal. Uh, prohibition just doesn't work, folks. Um, all right. There's a, another survey that came out. This is kind of interesting, and uh, I think it's echoing the, the change that's going across the country, and I think more and more people are catching on, and certainly more and more professionals are catching on. There's a survey that came out that shows that 67% uh, of doctors out there uh, say that cannabis should be a medical option. This is uh, quoted from leafscience.com. You can check out the article for yourself just by going to the website. Uh, there's an online survey of over 1,500 doctors in 48 states, and they v revealed strong support for marijuana as a medicine. Uh, you know, despite the fact that it's federally classified, blah, 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 67% of the doctors agreed that cannabis should be a medical option for patients. So uh, I think that's pretty cool. Um, I think it's just echoing fact. You know, doctors are starting to wake up to this now and realize that it is a viable option, uh, or that it should be at least. So, kind of cool. Um, all right, I got some information from different states. Try to keep track of what's going on around the country. I'll give you a quick recap. Uh, Nevada, they've given final approval to their uh, rules for dispensaries. So, uh, the state basically has put out regulations for dispensaries, and, and they, they gave it a final approval. So, they have medical marijuana available in Nevada. Just patients didn't really have a way to get to it. Uh, they could possess it, but, you know, there wasn't any place to go get it at. And basically Nevada kind of put their uh, ink down on paper and said, hey, all right, we finally got our act together. Uh, it's only taken us 14 years, but uh, at any rate, uh, they're going to go ahead and put forth regulations to be adopted. And uh, counties and cities have a 45-day heads up from the state before they start taking applications. So dispensers have to go through a 90-day period for a decision. And then if they get approved, they can start growing then thereafter. Uh, it says here that all cannabis sold has to be tested. So testing facilities are going to have to come online before the herb can actually get out to the patients. And that state officials expected somewhere around 425 applications to come in. So it uh, looks like the state's going to be hiring some new people. It says up to 27 new people may be hired to help manage all the paperwork. And uh, it says that you know cities will have to implement their business bans as well as give them uh, ability to place moratoriums on businesses. So cities will have the ability to you know, kind of zone these things or rule them out if they want to. But at any rate, patients will have a way here in the near future to be able to acquire their medical marijuana from state licensed dispensaries. So kind of interesting there, kind of cool. Um, next state I wanted to mention is Oregon. Uh, Oregon had a court case that went through here and they were looking at trying to make Marijuana infused edibles, basically medibles, as most of us in the patient world uh, know them as, they're trying to make them illegal. You know, trying to rule them out as not being included in the state law, uh, trying to basically say that this, this isn't something that should be available. However, uh, Supreme Court basically nixed that and said, no way, uh, edible infused products should definitely be included and protected by the medical marijuana law. Um, now, Really, what they're trying to do, in addition to 
clarify that as they did put out some regulations or some suggested guidelines from the state Supreme Court saying that, uh, you know, hey, you got to put a cap on how you're preparing the products. You know, they don't want things being attractive to children. They don't want it to be candy or, you know, basically colorful or childlike, you know, like an animal figure or something like that. And they also didn't want it to be like a copycat of what's being sold at stores. So, you know, we might have like Reese's Pieces or something like that or some Oreos or whatever. I mean, you know, these products that are curtailed or sort of, uh, you know, marketed towards the younger generation, they don't want your medicine-based products to emulate that and saying there's no really no reason for that. Uh, but in addition to the, the guidelines there, they are saying that, it, yes, dispensaries should allow, be allowed to carry these products and uh, they should definitely be included in the protections of the law. So kind of interesting there. I think that's a smart move. And patients certainly need to have ulterior ways of being able to ingest and uh, shouldn't be forced to go make their own products or, or not have them be protected for that matter. Um, at any rate, that's the deal out there in Oregon. Uh, next state coming up here I want to talk about is Arizona. There was a court case out there where the sheriff uh, basically busted the patient, legal patient, card-holding patient with medical marijuana, kind of drug them through the court system. They lost, so the patient was set free. And uh, the confiscated marijuana that was a part of that case went on to become its own court case. The, the sheriff refused to give back the medical marijuana to the patient that was confiscated during the arrest. And so the patient said, well, now I'm going to take you to court to get my medicine back. And, and that's what happened. The U.S. Supreme Court ruled that the, uh, the patient had the right back to his property. And so uh, this is something that's been overturned. And that was a U.S. Supreme Court decision. And I think that's kind of interesting. You put that in relation to what the uh, Michigan Attorney General put out a couple years ago, saying that uh, police do not have to give back medical marijuana if it's confiscated. Uh, saying that it would be a violation of federal law officers decided to do that. This court case sort of uh, nixes that. Uh, it's quite the opposite of what Bill Schuette was saying in his memo. And so I don't know what's going to happen here in Michigan. Uh, if, if medical marijuana is incorrectly seized, I think it should be given back. If the patient's legal within her limits, uh, it's for medicinal purposes, so on and so forth. Obviously, if, if, if all the cards stack up, then the patient has the right to that medication. And if it was incorrectly seized, well, it should, it should certainly be given back. I mean, I think that only makes sense. But uh, at any rate, the U.S. Supreme Court agrees with me on that one, amazingly enough. Uh, we'll have yet to see how that goes. But in Arizona, that guy got his stuff back. So it's pretty cool. Give him back the weed. Uh, all right, next state, Virginia. Um... Let's see here. Virginia put out a survey. I'm going to pull this up here. Quinnipiac, excuse me, Quin, Quin, Quinnipiac. The Indian names get me sometimes there. Quinnipiac University uh, came out and said, put out a survey, and uh, it looks like 87% of Virginians believe that medical marijuana should be made available. Uh, they didn't have quite the same support for recreational marijuana, but 84%, uh, excuse me, 84% of the people surveyed. Uh, in Virginia were in favor of medical marijuana. I mean, that's a pretty astounding majority there. Pretty amazing. I think from what I remember, too, uh, Virginia is conservative pretty much pol uh, politically. Yeah. Uh, and along the lines, pretty conservative. I so. think so. But, uh, you know, that's this is one of those issues that's starting to cross those lines between, you know, the, the typical liberal conservative argument, and you're seeing a lot more people from the, the, the right side, if you will, the conservative side, kind of come back around and, and realize that, you know what, there's enough of these cases now that we're hearing about. There's enough doctors out there that are saying this should, should be available. Uh, there's enough information. There's enough studies that have been done for them to sort of feel comfortable endorsing this for medicinal purposes. And, you know, I think it's about time. Um, any rate, looks like the majority of people in Virginia agree with me. Maryland, this is the next state I want to go over. They, their Senate approved a bill for medical marijuana. Uh, it has yet to move through the other parts of their state government, but it looks like Maryland is, is working through the issues. Might become one of those states here in the near future to have medical marijuana. It'll be interesting to see how many states this year uh, in the United States, how many states add on medical marijuana to their uh, list of available medicinal options for patients. What's the current count for uh, medical marijuana use? 22, I do believe. That's okay, yep. so that's yeah, so close to have, half. You know, it's, it, there's a potential... That by the end of 2014, you will have more than 25 states. It'll be more than a majority of states here in the U.S. that would have medical marijuana available on some level uh, for patients in, in uh, 
for their medicinal purposes. So we'll have to see. I mean, 22 is darn close, and it seems like more and more states you hear about legislation. I mean, we talk about it here on the show every week, all the different states that we talk about. And, uh, you know, you've got some CBD-only type legislation that's been floating around in a number of different House legislatures. Uh, you've got some decrim bills that are floating around. You know, those aren't even medical marijuana. It's just dumbing down the penalties, if you will, for uh, simple p adult possession. Um, you know, it doesn't make it legal, but it at least lessens the penalties that are associated with it. But uh, medical marijuana, yes, that's also growing. And I think that you probably will have more than 25 states by the end of the year. Uh, Florida does have it on their ballot. There's another one out there that is potentially looking at it. And uh, the list goes on and on. So every week we're always talking about it seems like another new state is introducing this or voting on this. And, uh, you know, we just have yet to see which state's going to take up the ball next. Um, I think that the important part is, is patients get access and get protection to their medication. You know, you've got states like New Jersey where, yeah, they have a medical marijuana law on the books, but there's no real viable way for patients to actually get any. Um, you know, in Nevada, it's been the same way for years. You know, patients could possess it, but there's no place for them to go to. So what are they supposed to do? You know, drive to Arizona, drive to California, drive to Colorado. I mean, that's a lot to ask a patient to have to drive to the next state just to get their, you know, medicinal supply. It's kind of insane. But, um, you know, as states continue to develop their programs, well, then, I mean, you're going to have more and more states jump on the bandwagon, I think, as they see it. Well, it's not dangerous. The sky didn't fall. Crime rates didn't go up. Uh, these things are being echoed by facts now and something that uh, your congressmen and women can't really overlook anymore. I mean, it's not just a, a, a fly-by-night myth anymore. All right, uh, another interesting story. You know, we talked about the NFL, talking about medical marijuana. Well, now that spring training's here, you've got Major League Baseball doing the same thing. Uh, interesting thing was they put out a survey to uh, a number of different Major League Baseball players out there, and they said, hey, if marijuana was legal in all 50 states, you know, would you consider using it for medicinal purposes? And actually 49% of the players that were surveyed stepped up and said, yeah, actually I would use it for medicinal purposes uh, if it were legal in all 50 states. So, uh, yeah, it's kind of neat that you've got players that are, you know, they know, they're not dumb. They know all the different types of treatments out there, and, and even the ones that they're not allowed to use. I mean, uh, they're, they're, obviously, marijuana could be an alternative to a lot of the different types of medications that you know professional sports players do use. And I think that they're unfortunate that you know even some of these players, you know, like the Detroit Tigers, for example, they're in a medical marijuana state. State legal wise, there's no reason why they couldn't go get themselves a card and be able to use it. But according to their Major League Baseball rules. They get tested, they could lose their ability to play the game anymore. And they, so they're not going to put their career on the line for something like that. And they're unfortunately forced to use harmful alternatives, potentially harmful alternatives instead. Uh, obviously, pain medications are a big thing for professional sports players. Being able to use something that's not going to hurt them, that isn't going to become addictive, uh, certainly be a nice alternative for a lot of these professional players. And it's not going to affect their ability to go out there and hit the ball. Uh, we've been able to prove that too. So. Interesting there. I'm glad players are willing to step up and actually voice their opinions. You know, a lot of these guys are so nervous about having their contracts being uh, canceled or, or getting penalties and fines associated to them for saying this or that. It's nice that they felt comfortable to be up and, you know, say something in the survey, at least, at least that way. A um, couple more things I wanted to cover before we run out this week. There's uh, two different things that went on in Michigan I want to talk to you. One is right here in the city of Flint. Uh, Flint City is looking at passing an ordinance for medical marijuana dispensaries or collectives or whatever you want to call them, distribution points. This is for those places operating within the sit city of Flint. Um, they have an ordinance drafted. It has not yet been passed. Uh, you can take a look at it if you want. You can call up the city council, and I'm sure they'll be able to give you a copy of that. But uh, it's kind of interesting. You know, It allows the city to go in and perform inspections. Uh, they have the ultimate authority to approve or deny an application. Uh, it's up to them to decide how it can operate, when, where, and so on and so forth. There's a few limiting factors in the ordinance. One is uh, you cannot have more than 15 employees work for any one of these uh, places. And uh, the other interesting thing was is there's a lot of fees that are associated in this ordinance. Uh, I think there's a $5,000 annual and um, excuse me, annual application fee that has to be paid. There's also $150 annual employee fee that's uh, that's been in, listed here. 
And uh, in addition to that, you know, like I said, uh, mentioned, they are going to have uh, the option to go in and inspect whenever they want. No notice, no warrant necessary if this passes. And uh, so give them the ability to do that, and then they would assign or assess a fee uh, for said inspection. So looks like a lot of fees in this ordinance. I, I got to tell you, I mean, for those guys that are out there already in the city of Flint and operating, um, I'm not sure if they'll be real happy about this. It's uh, again, it's up to the city of Flint to deny or approve the application. So as far as location, how it operates, so on and so forth, uh, that'd be up to the city of Flint to be able to determine case by case who and how they want to approve. Um, and then also, you know, you've got the the fee that's associated with it. So lots of fees could be potentially real expensive for these places to be able to operate. I know a lot of these places operate at a real low cost to their patients, so I'm not sure how they'd be able to afford the additional overhead cost associated with that, or if they would be able to even. Um, you know, and it'll be up to those businesses to decide if this should pass, whether or not they want to continue to operate. I didn't see anything in the ordinance that automatically grandfathers in the already existing operating places, so it looks to me like anybody who's in the city of Flint would have to, you know, if you're operating a center of any kind, um, you, you would have to, in fact, submit an application, pay the fees, so on and so forth. But uh, it does not say, you know, exactly who would perform the inspection. It's kind of up to the city to, to, to develop a team and to, to determine who those people would be that would perform the inspections. It doesn't necessarily say how often they would be. At least you could expect that they would be annual, if none, you know, nothing less. And uh, it looks like they would be unannounced. If you just show up whenever they want to and, and go in and make sure you're within your limits, uh, make sure you've got all your files in place and that you've paid your, your annual fee, so on and so forth. But, uh, you know, there's still time for you to voice your opinion. The city has not passed this ordinance yet. So if you're in the city of Flint and you operate a center, now is the time for you to definitely get on the horn and make your voice heard as to what you may or may not like about this particular ordinance. I know a lot of folks were uh, concerned, you know, whether or not our club would be affected. And, uh, you know, we're not. We're not in the city of Flint, fortunately, so this is not something that would affect us. Uh, we have an ordinance that's already been passed in the township that we operate, so I don't expect any changes there, hopefully. But uh, at any rate, if you're in the city of Flint, this is something you definitely want to key into and uh, make sure you're educated about it. All right, uh, last thing I want to share with you, this is something that went down in the Michigan Supreme Court. This is kind of an atrocity, so I'm kind of sorry to end the show on this note, but I think it's something you guys should hear about. Uh, the Michigan Supreme Court reviewed a case here just recently, and this is regarding a patient who uh, sold marijuana to an undercover officer. The story goes, basically, a patient uh, had some ads, uh, it appears, on Facebook, or at least was contacted on Facebook. This was a caregiver, uh, excuse me, Mr. Miller, and he was operating as a caregiver and had some ads out there. He was contacted through Facebook by an undercover officer. The officer had uh, basically produced, and it doesn't say how in the, in the Supreme Court case, but they had produced a fake medical marijuana card um, and uh, basically kind of created himself an undercover fake profile, you know, basically, you know, fake ailments. He had his little story about whatever was uh, supposedly his qualifying condition. And so the caregiver met with the patient. Um, turns out, you know, like I said, the, the, the patient did have a card, but uh, it was a fake. And the caregiver failed to uh, recognize that. And this is a, an unfortunate case. And the Michigan State Supreme Court ruled that because the... Uh, individual that the, the caregiver dealt with was not in fact a card holder uh, and because of the fact that he sold marijuana to this individual that he would not be provided the medical marijuana defense in the lower court. So they're kicking his case back down and they're saying that uh, he will be tried as a regular uh, drug dealer. He's not allowed to bring up the fact that he was you know operating underneath the Michigan medical marijuana law. Not going to be able to mention even the fact that he met with this uh, undercover officer can't mention the reasons why he met with that officer uh, or the reason why the transfer occurred and uh, that information will be barred from the jury being able to hear that info this is a court case in Berrien County and uh, you know this is something I think that should definitely be addressed I don't see how this is fair to Mr. Miller or any other individual for that matter I think that the jury should be you know privy to all information in this case it's, it's certainly all prevalent and uh, definitely pertaining to the, the court case itself. I mean, Mr. Miller would not have been there had this not been a, uh, a, a patient posing at least 
And uh, it, it seems that Mr. Miller has never had any other instances of dealing with people who do not have cards. Uh, and it seems like Mr. Miller was trying to operate within the law. You know, here he is uh, meeting this person, you know, digitally, obviously, at first. And then he says he met with him on two separate occasions and sold to him uh, a total of less than half an ounce of marijuana. And uh, so because of the fact, again, that the, the patient sold this, and um, because they were not signed up directly through the registry together, that the, uh, the police were able to get through this fake card, kind of pull one over on this caregiver. And so now the caregiver is being charged as a regular drug dealer. Um, so this is kind of definitely unfortunate and uh, a sad case. Um, man, I, I, this kind of thing here just puts the stomach in nuts, and it makes you feel like, uh, you know, I don't know, it just makes you feel like the system isn't really... All it's cracked up to be when you look at this guy who's got a card, you know, he deals with somebody else who's got a card, and the officer's the one that's, you know, manipulating the law. Kind of an ugly case there, if you will. Uh, I certainly don't think this is a wise use of law enforcement. It seems like... No, what, you know, it's like what they, he was operating under the law. Yeah, they're not supposed to be informed that there is a marijuana law. So they're actually, the, the courts and everybody else is like actually depending and really urging, uh, happy to know that the people aren't well, better informed. Yeah. And the media has largely ignored this, educating people about it, do, not doing their job again. Well, yeah, and I mean, the, the fact that now this guy, because uh, of what the court ruling is, he's not going to be able to even mention the fact that he has a car, that he was doing this for medicinal purposes, you know, or the fact that the officer had a card. Kangaroo um, court comes to mind, the expression kangaroo court. Oh, definitely. Yeah, I mean, this is all a load, load of crap from beginning to end. And the people who push this and allow this, the, the judges... I like to see them yanked off their benches and you yeah. Know. I, I think I can't agree with you more, John. And that's one of the reasons why I wanted to share this story with you. You know, Michigan Supreme Court justices are elected officials, and uh, definitely something that I think you should consider next time you go to the voting box. I don't agree with this kind of a decision. Um, you know, whether or not you agree with the decision itself, I think you can at least take into account the fact that you know now this guy's got to go in front of a jury and basically omit information according to the previous judges that uh, is you know definitely pertinent factual to the case at hand uh, it just seems like in other words yeah because you have to admit, they, they'd have to turn around and admit there's actually no crime that actually was committed other than the guy the cop acting and trying to entrap people which is against the law yeah I mean if the jury had uh, you know full information in this case I don't see how a jury could possibly convict this individual of anything illegal I mean it seems to me like he was trying to, in good faith, I mean, he, he obviously had verified that the individual had a card. They had talked about his medical condition, which was all made up. Um, you know, th this is, uh, to me, I don't see any more of a, what's this called, like a bait and switch or, you know, a, a entrapment. entrapment. It's entrapment, pure and simple. Is, uh, I don't see how you could have much more clear of a case of entrapment than this particular uh, case here. But uh, at any rate, this is what's going down. So, um you know, there is a number that you can contact if you guys are concerned about this for your own purposes. You know, there's a, a phone number you can contact, Lara's phone number, and you can verify, you know, if someone's withstanding to make sure that they do have a valid card. Um, and, you know, obviously if you're sending in your information, you know, when you do a caregiver change or you sign up a caregiver or maybe you sign up a new patient, you definitely want to make sure that that paperwork comes back before you start working with that individual to ensure that they are, in fact, a legitimate patient. You know, that's something that, as a caregiver, you have to think about, you know, that this paperwork could be forged or, you know, it's, it's not a real doctor that signed that paperwork. And that's the state's job to verify that information for you. That's why you pay them the fee, so on and so forth. So uh, you definitely want to do due diligence and making sure that you're dealing with legitimate people out there and that it's not somebody trying to pull the wool over your eyes. You know, hopefully it's not going to be an undercover cop as it was in this case, it's kind of an extreme scenario, but uh, you know more on the the other side of you know making sure you're dealing with legitimate individuals uh, and establishing a true relationship with them as a caregiver uh, patient caregiver relationship should be. So, all right, um, that's about all the info I have for you this week. I, I apologize again for our show being kind of cut up, and I appreciate you guys taking the time to stay with us, get that recap on information. If you want to check out the other episodes, we'll have them posted there for you. Uh, as much as we can gather from that info. John, thank you for putting up with it. I know it's tough back there in the studio. You get no love. But uh, if it wasn't for you, it wouldn't happen. So, hey, we're glad to be coming to you from FlintTalkRadio.com. Get out there and enjoy this beautiful weather that we're having. It's absolutely gorgeous. 
And uh, hopefully we'll see you this Friday at the Soup Kitchen. If not, stay tuned. We'll be back here next week. And again, don't forget about the 420 party happening April 19th. It's going to be an awesome time. Thanks for joining me this week on the Genesee County Compassion Club show. You guys have a good one. Thank you.